<laughs> Most legal experts agree that Jesus did not receive a fair trial. In fact, when Israel was established as a nation in 1948, one of the very first things that they did was set up a Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was petitioned by people to begin with uh, to retrial of, for a retrial of Jesus Christ. And he said, we want you to do this again because it didn't happen right way back when. Well, of course, they said they don't have any jur jurisdiction in the case anymore because it was so long ago. And they kind of shuffled it off and didn't do anything about it. But if you look back, it's really easy to see at what we have in the Gospels that, that uh, Jesus' trial was really a mockery of justice. And if you like to watch procedurals, you like to watch legal shows and kind of stuff, you know that there's a certain way that you bring witnesses, a certain way you bring evidence in for it to be a fair trial. And so the Jewish leaders, if we look at what we have in Mark and the other Gospels, we see that they couldn't agree on what, was, what he had done wrong couldn't agree with the testimony of what they heard, and uh, they shuffled him off the pilot, they shuffled him back over to Herod, then back to Pilate again, and during this whole thing, no one could find anything to accuse him of doing wrong, and at the end, instead of this mighty Roman government going, hey, you know what, you guys have just got something cooked up here, and we're, we don't want to hear what you have to say, and just dismissing the, court, the case altogether, they just passed the buck back and forth and back and forth, and they had him executed anyway. And so those, uh, so they just didn't want to deal with it because they were afraid of the opinions of others. And so as you might guess, we're up to the trial of Jesus in Mark chapter 15. And last week, if you were here, we talked about the denial of Peter and uh, his eventual restoration, we talked about it at the end, but his denial of Jesus came part, as part of the arrest of Jesus and his eventual, uh, uh, his eventual trial. Came, he, they, uh, he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, he was brought before the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish ruling council, and uh, he appeared before Caiaphas, who was the high priest, and, you know, so there was all this turmoil and everything, but everybody was talking to him and everything, and Jesus wouldn't say anything. He didn't, he didn't answer their questions. He didn't uh, uh, come back at what they were saying or try to defend himself at all until Caiaphas asked this specific question that we looked at a little bit at the end of last week, and that is, he asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus answers, I am with the very words that Moses heard from God at the burning bush is how God identified him. And if you hadn't read this part, then you can imagine the response. I mean, here's these guys who are, are trying to uphold the law of God, and they hear him say these words and then say You're, uh, he's going to sit at the right hand, that's the right hand of God, equating himself with God and coming on the clouds of heaven. And verse 63 tells us exactly what Caiaphas did. That is, he tore his clothes. And then he stopped the whole proceedings, and he said, why do we need any more witnesses? Now, clothing in this New Testament time, not as easy, not as cheap to buy uh, as it is in our day, right? You know, if you tear something, you're like, eh, I'll go out and buy a new one, right? <laughs> but that wasn't the way it was back then. And so to tear some, your clothes was destroyed to destroy something that is valuable and hard to replace, especially in the case of the robes of a high priest, right? I mean, they were very specific, they were very intricate, hard to make them, and so this, by Caiaphas, was a passionate display of what would have been mourning and grief, and he tore his clothes in response to what he considered to be blasphemy, is exactly what he says there in verse 64. And so he is very distraught that Jesus has elevated himself up to being equal to God. I mean, imagine if you heard somebody that you uh, was a popular preacher or teacher in our day say something like this, that they elevated themselves to be equal to God. I mean, how would you respond? I mean, first we'd say, oh, okay, he's gone off the deep end, right? <laughs> we think he was loony. And, but secondly, we as God followers, there's something on the inside of us that would be offended, right? How dare you say something so brash, so prideful that you would elevate yourself to 
equal with the most high. But that is, of course, except what? If it's true, right? And in this case, it was true. I mean, but Caiaphas doesn't see it. Neither do any of these uh, Jewish rulers here at the time. And so he, uh, so he demonstrates his outrage at what Jesus says by this ripping of these clothes. And that was effective. What Jesus said and what Caiaphas did was effective enough to bring them to all together, which they been, been, hadn't been together to this point, to bring them around a plan to get rid of Jesus. And that's what leads us up to chapter, verse 1 in chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priest, and that's everybody in the Sanhedrin, reached a decision. They found Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Now, this is in direct fulfillment of what Jesus has told the disciples all the way back in chapter 10, if you remember that. He told the disciples that these guys, their plot is going to succeed. That is, they're going to kill me, and then they're, or they're going to plot against me. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles to be killed. What's more Gentile than a Roman leader, right? So Jesus is sent to Pilate, and so to really understand what's going on here, why it unfolds the way it does, we kind of need to know a little bit more about Pilate. So from the scriptures, the other gospels, we understand that he is the governor, he's called governor of Judea, and he came to this position about five or six years before this. So he was in position before Jesus ever began his public ministry, and uh, instead of... But instead of being a governor like we think about today, like of our state, uh, the, better, the term they used back then was procurator. Uh, for us, a better term is not governor, you know, to have this uh, a lot of power and a lot of control over a large area. More like for us today, he was just an official agent of Rome. Um, we, he was like an employee for them and took care of taxes and estates. He had some authority over an area. Uh, minor providences, he could make decisions, as long as it was in line with what Rome did, they didn't care that much what he did, as long as he didn't you know, uh, undermine their authority, as long as he kept people in line, they were fine with most anything that he did. He was nothing like Herod in uh, power and influence, though. So we're so familiar with these stories, we kind of think, well, they must have been on the same level, but they weren't. Herod, way up here, Pilate sort of down here. Now, normally Pilate wouldn't reside in Jer uh, Jerusalem, but at this time of year, he has learned that he needs to be in this area to keep an eye on things because thousands and thousands of people flock to Jerusalem for Passover. And there was all kinds of stuff that would take place, you know, all kinds of rebel rousing, you know, that he just wanted to be there because the last thing he wanted was for Rome to be looking in this direction, like, can't you keep it? quiet over there. So he would move from where he lived over to Judea and, um, and, and take care of you know, anything, any kind of disturbance that would come up. Now, Judea, as far as Rome is concerned, was a very small province. Remember, Rome is humongous at this time. There were so many little towns and little cities and little, little areas that it was huge. So they couldn't be uh, paying attention to all these little things. So Judea was pretty small, pretty insignificant as far as the Roman Empire went, and so he was kind of a minor player. But he and his wife show up in Judea during this time, and uh, the only thing, you know, it'd be unusual really for a wife to travel with a governor like that, but for some reason she goes this time. Now the only, uh, only thing we really know about her, his wife is a single sentence in the Gospel of Matthew that tells us that God gave her a dream to go and tell Pilate, don't have anything to do with this innocent man. Now, when I was studying this, when I was studying about her and learning about her, I found this fascinating thing here in, in that there are actually seven unlikely people in the Gospels who proclaim the innocence of Jesus. These are not followers. These are not people who would be uh, called Christians or or, um, or, or even uh, Jews at the time, but these seven here proclaim his innocence. And um, you can look at this or write it down if you want to or take a picture, but uh, he, the first is Pilate's, well, these are not in any order, but Pilate's wife, who says, don't have anything to do with this innocent man. Pontius Pilate says, not once, but three times, I find no basis for a charge. Herod says he's done nothing to deserve death, 
Judas, who betrayed him, comes back around after this and says, I've betrayed innocent blood. The dying thief says he's done nothing wrong. The Roman centurion says he's a righteous man. And the guards even agree with the centurion and say that he's the son of God. And so I thought it was really interesting. I'd never really noticed that or paid attention to it before. But, uh, but as for Pilate, we learn more that he is a really weak guy, easily, easily manipulated, uh, like many rolling Roman officials were. They were out to do what they wanted. They were only concerned about themselves and their pet projects. He was not a champion for justice or interested in doing the right thing at all. He, uh, you can see this as we go through the trial here a little bit. Um, he, it records that he, uh, multiple times he tries to let Jesus go, but at the end, he does not have the strength to stand up and to, to counter the Jewish leaders and especially the crowds to uh, let Jesus go. Uh, but, but he eventually is manipulated into doing what he knows is the wrong thing. So verse 2 of Mark is a highly pared down account of the interrogation. If you read John, you read Luke, there's a lot more to it. But, you know, Mark, we've learned as we went along, have gone along that he is very purposeful in what he records and doesn't give a lot of detail sometimes. The question he has here is, are you the king of the Jews? Luke 22 helps us with why Pilate asked his questions. And so these, these guys, the, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders, accused him of three things, subverting the nation, opposing payments to taxes to Caesar, and claimed to be a king. So now Pilate would not care one bit about the, him, anybody subverting the nation of, of, of Israel. He didn't like the Jews. He was extremely anti-Semitic. They hated him. He hated. He, they hated him, and he hated them. He took money from their treasury, built his own projects. Um, he thought their traditions were weird. Didn't like them at all. And so he cares nothing for what anybody would have to do with the the. the um, Jewish nation. Um, uh, we know the thing about the payment to taxes to Caesar, if we just go back a little bit to when he was interacting with them out in the temple courtyard, this is a lie. Remember, they asked him, he was like, should we give taxes to Caesar? And he elevated the conversation. He said, yeah, whose picture's on that? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And so he, they don't tell him that part. <laughs> and so the last part is the claim that he is Christ. A king. Now, this is the one that Pilate would be most interested in, because if Jesus claimed to be a real king, then that would be treason, and that would be the thing that Rome would take interest in. That was kind of the unpardonable sin against Rome. If you came against Caesar uh, and equated yourself with him or tried to be a king, they took action about that. Now, remember that we just saw that Caiaphas was upset because Jesus had uttered blasphemy, right? But by the time they get to Pilate, they've changed that because they know he won't, they don't care anything, he won't care anything about blaspheming God. But so they change their accusation from tre uh, to treason to try to speak Pilate's language and to get him to act any way that they can. Because they did not have power, according to Rome, to carry out capital punishment. Only Rome could do that legally, so they needed them to step in. Now, Maybe you're wondering, wait a minute, whoa, 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 what about that thing in Acts where Stephen is stoned? Didn't they kill and cap uh, carry out capital punishment against him? Uh, yes, but that was technically against Roman law as well. But now remember, Rome, this massive, massive empire here, and that a lot of times they just stayed out of what would be a uh, minor issue in a small province. I mean, they didn't really care about what went on as long as it didn't affect the stability of Rome. They didn't care about some random guy who would have been Stephen to them, almost an unknown at the time. Uh, it got, it, and they would see, well, this is some guy who just got caught up in vigilante justice here. We don't care. Just go ahead and it's fine. But remember that Jesus at this time has had huge crowds following him. This is only about six weeks since the raising of Lazarus, and that got everybody's attention, right? That would be a really big thing still people talking about. And so I mean, any kind of, of, of attempt to, to uh, stone a popular figure like that, remember the whole coming in with 
the triumphal entry, right? Lots of waving, lots of commotion. Anybody who wanted, wanted to try to, you know, these Jewish leaders trying to stone this very popular figure, good chance that that might just backfire on them, right? It's like, okay, you know, no, we're not going to stone him. How about we stone you? <laughs> so they, they thought 50-50 chance it might go badly for them. And certainly some kind of uprising like that is going to draw the attention of Rome and the Roman army. Last thing that they wanted to have them bothering them and coming in and trying to settle things down because that never went well. So this trial was really them once again trying to pass the buck to somebody else. If they could get the Ro Romans to execute Jesus, then they would be in the clear as far as these Jewish leaders thought. Now, did Pilate really believe Jesus was a threat? I mean, he had, he had nothing going on to merit what they would think of as royalty in the Roman Empire. And it's significant to note that he would have appeared before Pilate here after the temple guards had flogged him. So he imagine how he looks. He is not looking like a king or anything that would be a threat to Rome at this point, right? So Jesus answers Pilate's question here. And he says, yes, it is as you say. Now, this is kind of a cryptic answer. Uh, it's kind of, you have said so, is what he's really saying there. Uh, not either, really a direct affirmation or a denial at all. Um, he's more like saying, yes, I'm a king, but not the kind of king you're thinking about. That's kind of what he was saying there. And now the parallel passage in John 18, Jesus tells Pilate that he, his kingdom is not of this world. Uh, and that whole passage in John's letter seems to indicate that Jesus left no doubt in Pilate's mind about his kingship and that it was his spiritual in nature. Pilate understood this to the extent that he, after he has his private conversation with Jesus, he walks out, talks to the Jewish leaders again, and basically says, I find no basis for a charge against him. So he's like, he's innocent. He's not, he's not no threat. He's not, not anything against Caesar. There's no charges. Y'all just made these things up. And you can imagine that this is not what the Jewish leaders wanted to hear. So they just kind of fly off the handle again, and they, they start accusing him of many things. And, and Pilate looks at Jesus and is like, don't you hear what they're saying? Can't you see what they're saying? Aren't you going to say something and, you know, all these charges? And you can imagine how, how upset they must have been and waving their arms and screaming at them and, you know, blaring, not, flaring nostrils and eyes all beady and everything. You can just imagine what it looked like. And he doesn't say a word. Jesus made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, what was he amazed at? I mean, you know, so imagine he, he has the ability to give him the death penalty. They're accusing him of all kinds of things, and he didn't say a word. Imagine this was at you, at your job, right? You're accused of something you know you didn't do, and all these people are bringing up these trumped up charges against you. Could you be quiet? I kind of think no, <laughs> right? I mean, we're gonna just gonna go, excuse me. <laughs> it's like, I have evidence here that I have not done this and we would be very vocal about it in all kinds of ways. But Jesus doesn't defend himself. Now, horizontal understanding, I mean, he shouldn't have to defend himself, right? Because what did Pilate just say? There's no charges against him, right? He's already said he's not guilty. This is the judge, basically, in this, and he said, you're not guilty. So if you trust the justice system, you ought to be able to walk out, right? Now, he's innocent. He knows he's innocent. Pilate knows he's innocent. And if he was the stronger guy, maybe... And now, vertical, on a spiritual plane, what it shows us here is that Christ has a resolute commitment to do what was planned from the foundation of the world. He's not trying to get out of this. He's told them over and over and over again, this is what's going to happen. So he's not here going, hey, 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 hey. I'm innocent and you know it. Just let me go. He understands that this is the very reason for which he was born. And he's just allowing this mockery of justice here to, to happen so that the greater good that God has planned from the beginning of time will happen. Now, so Martin moves on from the trial uh, before Pilate to the outcome. Now, he completely omits the whole thing with Herod. Um, he, by the way, also, as we saw on that screen, he also says he's, he's, um, he's innocent, sent him back to Pilate. 
And so next we see Pilate trying to shift the buck. He tried to send it to Pilate. Pilate sent it back to him. Now Pilate's like, okay, I don't want to deal with this. How can I shift it again? And what, now what he's going to do is going to try to shift it again to the crowd of people. So now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. Now, the usual scenario in Passover time was to release a prisoner. Now, you know that Passover marked the release of the Israelites from Egypt. So they had this, this, this habit, this um, uh, uh, thing where they would just say, okay, we have to see what you're doing. We know that, and we're going to do something that kind of helps you celebrate this, a goodwill gesture kind of thing. And they would pick out a prisoner, release it, say, hey, you know, we're doing the same thing kind of thing. And so what, what Pilate decides he wants to do is, I'm going to pick out the very worst guy I can find. Somebody who they're going to hate. Somebody who they don't want, would not pick, and they're, he's going to give them a choice between uh, uh, this guy Barabbas and um, Jesus. And that's what it says in verse 7. A man called Barabbas was in prison. He was an insurrectionist and a murderer. And so the pr crowd wanted Pilate to release them. And so what he says, <laughs> so he tries to give them this choice here, and he wants them to pick Jesus. But it backfired on him. And so he said, do you want me to release this king of the Jews? Knowing that and he knew they were envious. And, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas again. So Pilate knew Jesus was being railroaded. He knew that they were envious of him. And so the choice that Pilate put before them would be, was, couldn't be more clear cut. High profile killer, uh, uh, insurrectionist. We would call him a terrorist today. That's what we say. This is a terrorist. So you want to pick the terrorist? You want to pick the miracle worker? Seems pretty easy, right? And that's what he's counting on. Uh, but he, uh, so he's no doubt aware of what happened at the triumphal entry. And he's counting probably on these guys showing up who, who were behind Jesus and speaking up here. But we see how the crowd didn't listen and uh, they chose Barabbas and and he's like, what shall I do with the one you call king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. So he's trying to get out of it. <laughs> he's like, wait, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. And they crucify him. He's like, why? What crime has he committed? Once again, saying, he's not guilty. Why do you want to kill him? And then they shouted all loud, crucify him. Now he knows he's got a mob going on here. And so he caves. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over him, him over to be crucified. That's kind of where our section ends for today. But I want to wrap up this lesson with a reminder about this exchange between Jesus for Barabbas. And it's not just a prisoner swap, okay? It's much more than that. It is a substitution. This is really important. Jesus didn't just die instead of Barabbas. He dies in place of Barabbas. It's really important because Barabbas is guilty. There is a sentence to be carried out. It is carried out. It's just not against the guilty one. The sentence that belongs to Barabbas is carried out against Jesus Christ. And so few examples of the substitutionary atonement in Scripture are clearer than Jesus, the innocent man, taking the penalty for the guilty Barabbas. And so here's where it gets really good. Um, and you might know that the word bar means son in scripture. And so in this case, bar Abbas is his name. And you realize Abbas means father, right? So bar son of, Abbas means father. So literally his name is son of the father, okay? And so if you've heard that before, maybe you have. But what you may not realize is that in some of the very earliest manuscripts we have of the New Testament, these documents indicate that Barabbas was not really actually his name. It was really a designator, more like a last name that we would think about today. Like you would see Peter's name in scripture, uh, Simon bar Jonah, that would be Simon son of Jonah. Uh, now that's really very much like what we do today. With, um, you know, they named, back then, they named uh, kids a lot of Hebrew names. So there was a lot of Simons running around. There's a lot of Rubens running around, <laughs> all kinds of people. And so you would say, oh, is this Simon, son of Reuben? No, that's Simon, son of Jonah, right? So 
it was a designator. So in, in the case of these oldest manuscripts, they give the first name of Barabbas as Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. And if that is accurate, there are some people who disagree, the choice could not be clearer, right? Jesus, capital son of the Father, Jesus Barabbas, lowercase son of the Father. Now remember back, back to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Very first lesson we had, very first verse of this whole book is that this letter was written, that uh, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, son of of God, right? So he wants the reader to understand at this point that Jesus is the true Son of God, the true Son of the Father. So the guilty, lowercase Son of the Father, goes free, is replaced by the true, one, and only pure, capital Son of the pa Father. Now, this is driven home even more when we kind of fold into all of this story what happened at the Old Testament Day of Atonement. Go back to the Old Testament again. We talked about this once before. Leviticus 16 talks about what happens at the Day of Atonement. So on this day, uh, the crucial day of this Jewish year, the high priest would intercede before God on behalf of all the people. And so part of what he did was he cast lots over two goats. They bring them in as, as, the goat, uh, as, as sacrifices. And so one of them became the sacrificial goat, that is, he was slaughtered, blood spilled out, poured out as a sacrifice. The other one became the, sa the scapegoat. Now this one, the priest ceremonially put his hands on the head of the goat, symbolically transferring the sins of all the people onto this goat, and then he was released into the wilderness. Okay? So he lived and was set free. The blood of the one goat atones for the sins of the people, a blood sacrifice. The other one, representing the sins of the people, is represents the separation of sin from them. So the two goats to get together form one sacrifice. One of them being killed, the other one being let go. Now apply that to what you see here in the Gospel of Mark. Notice that the innocent goat is killed, right? The one that doesn't have the sin on him. That one is killed. The one that has the sins transferred onto it is the guilty one is released. Parallels with the story of Barabbas absolutely perfectly, right? God does everything perfectly, not halfway, not sort of, not kind of, because here in the, in the reality of what we saw in the Day of Atonement, what happens with Jesus and Barabbas is foreshadowed right here. The perfect innocent one is examined, declared innocent, not once, but three times by Pilate, seven times by these, these other people. Here, he, he, and his blood is shed to atone for sin. The other, undeniably guilty one, is released and set free. So here, the guilty is let go, the innocent slaughtered. This is the gospel. That is what it is. The innocent son of the father, capital son of the father, the perfect, the pure, the holy one, is slaughtered so the guilty can go free. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, God, he God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, perfectly innocent, so that in him we might, we the guilty, might be become the righteousness of God. So Barabbas is not just a story of fulfilled prophecy or historical narrative that we're looking back on. It is a story of you and me. All believers in Christ, this is the story. We are born into this world as guilty sinners, rebels, insurrectionists, and our sin landed us in a spiritual prison, bound helpless, awaiting the day when we will receive a just punishment from God as sinners and everything that we deserve. Our guilt is not in question. 100% we're guilty. Loads of evidence mounted up against us. And, be but because, and because of that, we sat on, sat on the death row of all death rows awaiting to be dragged out one day before the righteous God, God and receive his verdict of guilty on us. That's what we need. That's what we should have had, right? But before you ever even knew anything was, was happening, or before you ever 
even cared. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us. That while we were sinners, we don't care. We rebel against him. We don't want anything to do with him. Christ died for us. Jesus took your place. He gets what you deserve. When you trust him as Savior, you get what he deserves. That is access to God's throne. Eternal membership into his family. It is the greatest exchange in all of history. Jesus gives up your li his life so that you can have life and be set free. Barabbas, revolutionary, murderer, insurrectionist, has no right to be remembered at all, let alone be held up as an example of divine grace. But that's the whole point, right? He didn't deserve it. Neither did we. But Christ died for you anyway. It's not about worthiness. It's about grace. A divine substitution. And through it, through your faith in him and what he did, you become bar abbas, a true son, a true child of the Father. Amen? God, we just thank you. Wow, <laughs> we're so overwhelmed sometimes when we look at all the things that you've done. Why do you even have looked in our direction when we have been so guilty of sin and our own insurrection against you? But God, you love us. It's overwhelming sometimes. And we thank you for the gift of your son. God, help us to absorb what you did for us, what you continue to do for us, what you did by placing the Holy Spirit within us so that we can walk after you. God, give us a new heart for you. Help us to marvel at this so familiar story in a new way so that we'll be changed, that we will walk as your true sons and daughters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, ladies.